Imagination is one of those omnipresent words that people use all the time. But before I started this module, I'd never really taken the time to consider the depth of meaning that comes with it. To be honest, even after all these weeks, I'm still finding it hard to rationalise a discrete definition because it's such a wide and intangible concept with so many different facets. I think above all, what this module has taught me is that there's no one hard and fast way to define what the imagination is because it encompasses a whole range of subjective experience. But, I'm a scientist. And not being able to define things makes me uncomfortable. As such, I think we can view the concept through specific lenses by which we can delineate which of its many properties we're talking about. Whether it's the unfettered curiosity that comes with childhood and play, the first sparks of wonder that set off creative urges, or the ability to take an already existing piece of work and interpret it differently, these all utilise wildly different aspects of the imagination. Over the next 14 or so minutes, I'll be discussing a few of the moments from sessions that affected me most, peppered by some of my general reflections on the module and its assessment. Now, I had very little idea what to expect when I turned up at the first session. The first half an hour consisted mostly of team building exercises, for example to build the highest tower or discuss how certain things would relate to our disciplines. All of these had goals and served the obvious purpose of getting us to meet one another. However, the second half of the session was completely at odds to this when we entered Robbie Falston's The Making Space. I spent the next 40 minutes playing with Lego under a bubble machine. To be honest, it was a very odd start to a Tuesday morning. It was great. It was bizarrely therapeutic. At the door of the making space, we were told to leave our phones outside and just do whatever we wanted. It wasn't for work or for a reward. I didn't try and educate myself and I didn't take any pictures for Facebook. I used that time just to play. And it made me realise just how rare it is that I do things without searching for a tangible gain. Williams and Penman note that more mindful people engage in more autonomous activities. Those who are more mindful will spend more time doing things that they truly value or that they simply find fun or interesting. Williams and Penman link higher levels of mindfulness with increased happiness and efficiency, which might imply that intermittent periods of play may actually be beneficial to one's happiness and perhaps surprisingly their work output. Since experiencing the making space in the seminar, I wonder, I've been trying to make a conscious effort to be more mindful of my thoughts and my surroundings to try and recapture that generalised feeling of wonder about the world that I felt as a child. In his work, The Doors of Perception, Aldous Huxley suggests that the brain actively works by filtering out most of what we should otherwise perceive or remember at any moment, leaving only that very small and special selection which is likely to be practically useful. This has been corroborated by neuroscientists who've estimated we only take in about 0.00181% of what we experience at a time. The rest, our brain decides not to focus on, using a part of the brain called the locus ceruleus to consolidate the new information with old information to filter out the things that aren't biological imperatives. Certain psychedelic drugs, like mescaline, the one that Huxley was discussing, appear to disrupt this filtering process, meaning that users feel that they experience the world, in the words of Huxley, as such, rather than through the lens of their preconceived ideas. In a way, I think this perhaps explains to me why children exhibit such intense interest in the world around them. Their libraries of connections are incomplete and so their brains are constantly forced to try and make new connections. I think that's also why adults, much like myself, feel that as we get older we find it more difficult to connect with that childlike sense of curiosity and wonder. My brain has seen it all before and it no longer finds it interesting. And before those early sessions, it wasn't something I'd thought twice about. It was just a fact of life, children play and adults don't. The idea that I could or should recapture that sense of wonder never really crossed my mind. The Making Space inspired me to work towards redeveloping that interest in things, that interrogation of what makes things how they are and why, and that's something that's really stuck with me. It was also a really effective icebreaker, which is so important in a module like this where self-expression is paramount. This is the first time in an academic setting that I've worked in an interdisciplinary group, which was actually rather daunting at first. If I were to take this module again, I think I'd definitely try to set up some kind of social early in the proceedings, because with something as personal as your own imagination and creativity, it can be really hard to express yourself around people you don't know. However, as the workshops progressed and people began to relax around each other, I was really surprised by the number of differing viewpoints that people brought, and it was a real pleasure to be in a group that was so happy to consider each other's viewpoints and make an effort to engage with the content, even when it was something they didn't consider their strong points. I think it's a genuine credit to the module organisers that they were able to foster this kind of environment. I mean, some of the sections I personally found more interesting were the ones that had more scientific content, for example, those led by Nick Barker and Shama Rahman. Uh, but talking to the other members of the group, a lot of them seemed a little bit put off by their science and preferred those that centred on society as a whole. And, you know, that's a good thing. Part of the true beauty of interdisciplinary studies is that ideas within these groups are non-homogenous. But what really surprised me is that even when speaking to the other scientists in the group, I'd often come up with wildly different viewpoints to them. 
Philosopher John Dewey viewed education as a continuous process of reconstruction of experience. And that resonates with me here because I've realised how little we are limited to our disciplines. Our expertise is influenced by the sum of all our experiences, aspirations and our political and social views as well. We continually accumulate experiences and use them to reformulate our views on the world around us. I never felt like Oliver Higgins the chemist during these workshops because I always felt like I had more to add than just what came from my discipline. And I'd never really considered it before, but it surprises me how little of higher education seems to incorporate interdisciplinarity, when that's exactly what real world problem solving often requires. Take for instance a story I'm personally inspired by. Here we have two extremely intelligent career biologists, James Watson and Francis Crick, men of incredible intellect certainly, but they never would have discovered the double helix structure of DNA if it weren't for the prowess and X-ray crystallographic techniques brought to the table by Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins, a chemist and a physicist respectively. There are a hundred other stories just like this of, you know, unlikely people discovering incredible things that we use every day. C.L. Palmer observed that the problems of the real world rarely arise within orderly disciplinary categories and neither do their solutions. And so I find it quite bizarre that, you know, specifically as a chemist, we are given so little choice to take optional modules outside of chemistry. This imposed specialisation was something I wanted to explore further. During my reading, I stumbled on a quote from Robert Heinlein, and it's quite a long quote. Uh, but the crux of it is this. Specialisation is for insects. This and Nick Barker's lecture on the aspirational imagination stood as a starting point for my imaginative stimulus. The quote inspired me to use an anthropomorphic bee to represent the struggles of underprivileged children who may not be given the choice over their future that they deserve. According to Tremblay et al, low self-esteem is one of the leading causes of academic underachievement. And so I decided to create a piece that would raise aspirations of young people, targeting the piece towards 9 to 11 year olds due to this being an essential formative point for self-definition as identified by Vygotsky. In line with a good deal of already existing children's television programs, I decided to use animation and poetry to tell my story. Thus, Bert the Bee was born. Hello Bert! Hi Bert, how you doing? Long time no see. Now this piece actually turned out rather well. Other than perhaps clearing up some of the questions posed on the worksheet, there is little that I would have changed if I were to do it again. It was something I really enjoyed making and I was very pleased with the mark I received for it. That said, the actual process of deciding what the best topic to focus on out of the multitude possible areas was very difficult. However, other members of the group didn't seem to face the same troubles as me, and you know, I have a feeling why this was. I mean, undergraduate chemistry rarely asks for your opinion. As chemists, we're assessed very much in a yes-no binary with regards to right and wrong answers, which really isn't applicable to the type of assessments this module required. I feel that members of the group from other disciplines would have had more practice in this due to having more freedom to choose their own topics and assessments. This unfamiliarity was something that I would often reflect upon in my learning journal. Despite the paramount importance of utility and ethics concerns in real-world science, subjectivity in science education is seen as being largely unimportant. Empiricism is treasured above all, and while hard evidence is required in real-world science, in an educational setting, the lack of free thought has at times made me feel undervalued. In chemistry, we seem to sit tests to answer questions the markers already know the answers to. While that's a good learning exercise, it isn't actually achieving anything outside the boundaries of the test score. I've often felt that in the entire time I've studied chemistry, it's prompted very few original thoughts. Sometimes it feels like I'm being tested for the sake of being tested. For this assessment, we were given the freedom to create whatever we liked to stimulate someone else's imagination. I, however, with my scientific assessment mindset, saw a question without a yes-no answer and was instantly terrified that I would answer it wrong. I'm reminded of Ken Robinson's words, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. And I think that's a fault in the way sciences are taught. They encourage a fantastic amount of logical thinking which could be seen as exercising the scientific imagination, but more often than not, in my experience, it devolves to just rote learning. Scientific educators so often neglect that equally important skill of independent creativity, which I think is genuinely hard to introduce at times, but I think would be a worthy pursuit. Jean Piaget stated that education above all should create pupils capable of doing new things and not simply repeating what other generations have done, and that to me is the point of science, to solve old problems with new solutions. Without fostering creativity, how is that supposed to be achieved? After all, Einstein himself is quoted as having said that imagination is more important than knowledge, knowledge is limited. The experience with the imaginative stimulus gave me much more confidence from the outset in creating my student-advised assessment. I think this was a combination of having a clearer idea what I felt imagination was, having received good feedback from my imaginative stimulus, being able to draw on the information in my learning journal, and pure and simple worrying less about whether what I was doing was going to be right. I decided to attempt a workshop that allowed participants to reflect on how their environments affected their creativity while performing a number of writing-based tasks. 
I was most heavily influenced by the workshop on music and neuroscience, initially planning to run the workshop as an experiment which verified the conditions under which people were most creative. But I eventually moved away from this idea because it struck me as attempting to force scientific methodology on something that was inherently non-scientific. And as such, I decided instead to focus on creating a workshop that allowed self-reflection. The workshop was very successful, having run it with a few of my friends over the Christmas break. I decided to show this as a film because I think that's the best medium through which to allow the viewer to experience the locations. You might also wonder why I've decided to present this as an animation, and that's mostly a matter of personal preference. My journey through this module has been deeply personal, it's made me reflect a great deal on my own personality and the way in which I've been educated, and I think it would be difficult to discuss that in a purely textual form without coming across as quite cult, which would be at odds with what I'm saying. But to be honest with you, I think if I were to do this exercise again, I might actually not use the animation format because the nature of having to create a presentation to accompany my voice means that I have less time to create the content that I'm saying. That said, I learned to use an animation program from scratch in order to create Bert the Bee and this piece of work, which is something I've always wanted to do anyway. I mean the animations are rudimentary, but it's acted as a starting point, which I think is a really positive thing. This is the first time I've ever truly considered the wider implications of the imagination, and I see now that it pervades everything, from politics to economics to how we consider ourselves and our futures. The imagination is part of that essential spark that makes us self-aware, and it's not always a good thing. Just as it allows us to think, it also generates our every depressive thought, moment of self-doubt and pity. It's where the atom bomb came from, and the machine gun. But that's just part of being human. It's a tool, like anything else, it needs to be used correctly. I'm sad that this module's over. Because without going into how much it's reformulated my preconceptions and made me look at the world differently, I just enjoyed it. I feel like it has genuinely made me a more curious and more interested person. The making space specifically had such an effect on me that I'm still engaging in daily sessions of mindfulness meditation and attempting to accomplish more autonomous activity. I mean, to put it bluntly, when else will I get to wake up on a Tuesday morning and listen to a string quartet or watch a scientific magic show? Sit side by side with a sociologist and have them explain to me what it's like to walk upstairs from their perspective. When else do you get to do that? The answer is, at least as far as chemistry is concerned, you don't. Thank you for listening.